Throughout my childhood in New Orleans, I spent many summertime days at the end of the Mississippi River at South Pass. Back then, you could climb up the lighthouse and look over dense marsh full of nutria. During the day, we'd take the long trip out to the deep water of the Gulf of Mexico to find the rip, where the clear blue saltwater meets the Mississippi's sediment-laden freshwater. Anchoring in the bay, we'd try to catch redfish in the mornings and evenings, spending the long waiting periods between bites, admiring the complex layers of autumn clouds in the Louisiana sky. In 2013, I flew in a small fixed-wing plane over these same marshes of my childhood. My purpose was to take aerial photographs of the wetlands connected to so many memories and to see for myself the damage done by years of erosion, subsidence, and storms. Looking down from the plain, I did indeed encounter a fractured and sickly marsh compared to what I remember from half a century ago. The stark, spare wetlands dotted by birds still struck me as beautiful, but areas of dense green marsh that had bordered the Mississippi River were now open water. So that when you're in a boat, it looks like, oh, the marsh is in pretty good shape. But when you get up in the air, you see, well, the interior of this marsh is beginning to, to open up into open water. And unfortunately, that's what so many thousands of square miles of our coastal marsh looks like. In 1988, I had the opportunity to go to Alaska. That was the first time I'd ever seen a glacier. I did fall in love with ice and icebergs, and I realized that I really wanted to see the large ice that was in Antarctica. In 2011, I was given the opportunity to go only to photograph ice. We saw extraordinary ice, and at that point, I knew what was going on as far as sea level rise was concerned. And I wanted to start documenting. On first glance, the ice of Antarctica and the coastal wetlands of Louisiana couldn't look any more different. But as I edited my polarized photographs, certain images and shapes began to remind me of similar ones from the marshes of Louisiana. It was then that I began to understand the deeper underlying relationships between melting glaciers and vanishing wetlands, two aspects of climate change and rising waters that threaten the survival of our species on this planet. You see land being taken by the ocean, but you also see big ice glacial packs going into the water and disappearing. Both of them are disappearing. They're happening at the same time. Pairing these things together without text, you have one picture from the Arctic, be it a glacier or a lagoon, and another from the wetlands, and it's those two pictures in discussion with one another that creates meaning. And we're all gonna see different meaning in those pairings, but it's really inviting a conversation that you can only have through looking at pictures. You know, if you look at both of these, I love that you're both looking at and down yeah. at the landscape, which is something that we can't do if we're standing there. We don't apprehend it that way. Uh, and yet I think that actually in a show that is so much about the movement of water up and down, this idea that these things are almost falling off the page is, is very appropriate and powerful. I want the viewer to question why those rocks are on that water, yeah, how did ice, they get whatever. there? Yes, what? how did they get there? <laughs> The same people who are struggling in South Louisiana are the same people who are struggling in the Arctic. Our indigenous people, our indigenous tribes, what are they seeing every day? What are the people who live in and with the land seeing every day? I think that's what this art does and it's really necessary. It's kind of a love story between the two places. And um, I had a hard time coming up with a name. Lamentations is the name, but Lost was one of my first names for it. Um, because both are going to be lost. 50% of our population worldwide lives within 50 miles of the coastline. And so there are going to be a lot of people that are going to need to be relocated. And people don't really realize what needs to happen. And um, 
we can't wait. By juxtaposing these images of polar ice and coastal wetlands, we can see the interconnectivity between these geographically and visually disparate locations. We can see, too, in these photographs, the singularity of our planet's water, a global tapestry spanning Louisiana marshes to icebound poles and unraveling before our eyes faster than we realize. 